15. On the Limits of Love Further to what we have already discussed, the beginning of the spirit limits the scope of love, demarcating a spiritual limit to its immediate, naive overflow. Spiritual love is not only a religious devotion, but at its core it is primarily a clear-sighted, living, substantive choice. If we understand love not in the sense of a sentimental, pointless emotion, but in terms of its substantive definitude and functional totality, in the fullness of living validation, compassion, assistance, and communication, all the way up to artistic identification with the beloved object, it is clear that it is impossible to truly love everything, for example, both what is perceived and unperceived, or all things equally, for example, both near and distant, sacred and profane. In any case, a person, while he is a person, finds this impossible. The one who says that he loves everything, or everything without distinction, is either mistaken in his knowledge of himself, or in reality does not love anything or anyone. Love as a psychic force is completely incapable of such an irrelevant application. Love as a spiritual state is not at all designed for it. Of course, if by love one only understands benevolence, then for the benefit of spiritual improvement, i.e. the victory of good over evil, the religiously enlightened person loves everyone insofar as he desires the good of everyone. For the mere presence of evil already engenders within him suffering and disgust, and renders him sincerely benevolent. But if we understand love in its entirety as an identifying unity and creative acceptance, then such a person cannot love everyone, nor everyone equally, and does not set himself such a task. So, no one is called to love evil as such or an evil person as such, and if one thinks of the devil as a genuine and pure center of evil, then the love of the devil with all his evil must be recognized as completely unnatural. There is a sense in which one might desire the transfiguration of the devil, and there is a profound meaning in prayer for the devil, but there is no point in approaching him with creative acceptance, that is, accepting his goals and interests as one's own, sympathizing with him and helping him, and there is no reason to enter union with him, uniting one's own work with his evil. Of course, a person who is strong in spirit can decide to receive the devil in all of his genuine content, to let his pure evil into his soul for purposes of trial, knowledge, and wisdom. He can even bring out of this test some artistic identification, assigning for this painful and abhorrent task the fabric of his soul and the strength of his personality. But this admission will never turn into a loving acceptance for him, and this realization will never involve or capture his spiritual center, thus leading him into sympathetic action and assistance. The torment of this test will consist not only in the perception of the heinous, but also in the voluntary division of one's mental fabric. This will be expressed in the continuous, repulsive shudder of the whole spirit, both in those parts affected by the evil, and in its center kept free from evil. Moreover, this test, from which the soul burns like coal and quickly ages in agony while the spirit is tempered and wizened, has a single justification and purpose, resistance to evil. The receiving person receives only in order not to accept. Identification serves only this purpose, allowing a man to withstand evil as one who knows the measure of, sees, and understands the enemy. In this trial he recognizes and arms himself, and having become armed, he finds himself able to recognize the inexorable appearance of the devil experienced in all his substance. It is clear that for a weak person this test can become an excessive temptation, and the temptation can lead him into submission to evil, and this temptation and subsequent fall can materialize not only due to the usual causes of blind or naive infection by evil, but also because of an incorrect comprehension of the limits of love. It's enough for a tender-hearted man to lose sight of the fact that love ends where evil begins, that one can and should only love a spark, a ray, and an image, if it does not fade into the darkness of an overflowing evil, that in turning towards evil from a position of love, there can remain only spiritual benevolence. That this spiritual benevolence, when directed at the devil, can take in every instance only one true form, the form of the attending sword, and that if we lose sight of this, then the victory of evil is assured. There is a wise Christian legend about a hermit who for a long time overcame the devil in all his forms and all the temptations that issued forth from him, until finally the enemy knocked at the door of his isolated retreat in the form of a wounded, suffering raven, and at that moment a blind, sentimental compassion triumphed in the soul of the hermit. The raven was admitted, and the monk was given over to the power of the devil. It is this sentimental love, flowing out of weakness and having the value of temptation, which is limited by spiritual sight and spiritual will. They force a man to establish certain distinction in place of his indiscriminate and unprincipled sensitivity and draw his recognizing eye to the images of the Archangel Michael and George the Victorious. 
It would be needless to refer to this as some kind of objection to the commandments of Christ, who taught us to love our enemies and forgive our grievances. Such a claim would only testify to the inadequate thoughtfulness of the person making it. Calling on us to love our enemies, Christ meant the personal enemies of a man himself. Your, you, Matthew 5, 43-47, Luke 6, 27-28, his own haters and persecutors, whom the offended, naturally, can choose to forgive or not forgive. Christ never called us to love the enemies of God, to bless those who hate and trample upon all that is divine, to assist blasphemous seducers, to kindly sympathize with the obsessive molesters of souls, to be in awe of them and to possess a strong sentiment that nobody standing in opposition should interfere with their villainy. The contrary is in fact true both for such people and even for those incomparably less guilty. Christ also had fiery words of reproof, Matthew 11, 21-24, 23, Mark 12, 38-40, Luke 11, 39-52, 13, 32-35, 20, 46-47, etc. And the threat of severe retribution, Matthew 10, 15, 12, 9, 18, 9, 34-35, 21-41, 22, 7, 13, 24, 51, 25, 12, 30, Mark, 8, 38, Luke, 19, 27, 21, 20 to 26, John, 3, 36. And driving out of a scourge, Matthew, 21, 12, Mark, 11, 15, Luke, 19, 45, John, 2, 13 to 16, and impending eternal torments, Matthew, 25, 41, 46, John, 5, 29, Therefore, a Christian who strives to be faithful to the word and spirit of his teacher is not at all called to unnaturally force his soul to feel tenderness and affection towards the impenitent villain as such, and he cannot find in Christ's commandments either a reason or a pretext for evading resistance to villainy. He only needs to understand that the immediate, religiously faithful resistance to evildoers is in waging a battle against them, not as with personal enemies, but as with enemies of the cause of God on earth. And this is such to the effect that the less personal enmity in the soul of the resisting party and the more he internally forgives his personal enemies, all of them in general and especially those he fights with, then the more faithful, more worthy, and vitally more practical this struggle will be for all of its necessary severity. This applies in the fullest sense to the command to forgive grievances. According to this commandment, a person has a calling to forgive his offenders of any personal offenses. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Matthew 18.21 If they sin against you seven times in a day, Luke 17.3-4 His fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, Matthew 18.28 At the same time, the scope of forgiving kindness and patience must be truly infinite, Matthew 18.22 However, even in the consideration of personal resentment, the gospel establishes the conditions under which your brother that sinneth against you may become for you as a heathen or a publican, Matthew 18, 15-17, recognizing a force of personal bitterness that is unshakable by any persuasion. Rebuke him, Luke 17, 3. The gospel points to the court of the church as the highest authority, disobedience to which bears for itself the compulsory, educating isolation of the embittered. It is clear that appealing to this judgment and excommunicating the offender does not in the least interfere with the act of internal forgiveness, and in the same way, the act of personal forgiveness, solving the problem of offense, does not at all solve the problem of the offender and his bitterness. However, apart from this, Christ foresaw and pointed out such villainy, seduction of the small, which, according to him, would render the death penalty the best outcome for the villain. Matthew 18.6, Mark 9.42, Luke 17, 1-2. Generally speaking, one would need real spiritual blindness in order to reduce the whole problem of resistance to evil to the forgiveness of personal insults, to my enemies, my haters, and to my mental and spiritual overcoming of an offense, and it would be completely wrong to attribute such spiritual blindness to the gospel. Naturally, a naive person with his purely personal and meager worldview does not see good and evil in their more than personal dimension, not recognizing their social, universal, and religious dimensions, and this is why he believes that personal forgiveness extinguishes evil and resolves the problem of fighting it. But clearly this isn't the case. To forgive an offense extinguishes in oneself its malicious power, and bars access to oneself for this stream of hatred and evil, but this does not mean that it defeats the power of malice and evil in the offender. After forgiveness, the question remains opened and unresolved. What is to be done with the offender? 
not as a person who offended me and for whom revenge or retribution is due on behalf of myself, but as an unrepentant and uncontrolled abuser. For the existence of a villain is a problem not in the least for one victim and not only to the extent that this victim has been unable to forgive. This is instead a problem for all, and therefore for the victim as well, but not considered as a victim and one who is unable to forgive, but as a member of that social union which calls him to the service of mutual social education and to the organized struggle against evil. One who is offended can and must forgive his resentment and extinguish the offense in his heart. But it is his personal heart and his personal injury that limits the competence of his forgiveness, and anything further exceeds his rights and his vocation. It is hardly necessary to prove that a person has neither the ability nor the right to forgive an offense inflicted against another, or villainy which tramples on divine and human laws, given the caveat, of course, that he is not a priest with the authority to shrive the penitent, nor the supreme state body with the authority to grant amnesty. In the structure of every lie, every violent act, every crime, quite apart from the personal aspects of insult and injury, resides a superpersonal aspect which leads the criminal to the court of society and the law and God, and thus it is clear that the personal forgiveness of a private person does not invalidate this jurisdiction and its possible verdicts. In fact, who gave me the right to forgive by myself the villains who actively profane holy things, or practice the vicious seduction of minors, or bring about the death of the homeland? And what is the meaning of this supposed forgiveness? What does it mean, that I do not condemn or accuse? Who appointed me as a merciful judge? Or is it that I reconcile myself with their crimes and I undertake not to interfere with them? But from where proceeds this imaginary right to treason, to a betrayal of the sacred, the homeland, and the defenseless? Or, perhaps this forgiveness means that I abstain from any judgment, wash my hands, and leave events to their inevitable course. However, such a position of indifference, lack of will, and permissiveness has nothing to do with Christian forgiveness and cannot be justified by any references to the gospel. He who resists evil must forgive personal grievances, and the more sincere and complete this forgiveness, the more such a person is capable of leading an impersonal, objective struggle against the villain, and the more he will be called upon as an organ of the living good, not avenging, but compelling and suppressing. But in his soul there should be no place for naive and sentimental illusions, which consider that the evil in the villain has been defeated the moment he is personally forgiven. Forgiveness is the first condition of the fight against evil, or, if you will, the beginning of it, but not the end and not a victory. For this great struggle against evil, it is truly necessary to have no less than twelve legions of angels, Matthew 26.53, and a real villain, until he sees these legions, will always see in forgiveness a direct encouragement and maybe even a hidden sympathy. It is in this connection that we should also understand the gospel's words, do not resist the evil, Matthew 5.39. The rule contained within them is clearly explained in the following way. In the sense of an affectionate deterring of personal grievances, as well as the generous giving up of personal property and individual services. To interpret this call to gentleness and generosity in personal matters as a call to the inactive contemplation of violations and injustices, or to subjugation to evildoers in matters of righteousness and spirit, would be unthinking and unnatural. Is it fair to betray the weak to the villain in order to show gentleness? Or is a person free to expose another's cheek to an attacker as substitute for their own? Does not generosity only apply to one's own personal property? Or is squandering public property and giving one's brother into slavery also a sign of generosity? Or should the villains be given the freedom to burn temples, plant atheism, and destroy their homeland? Is this what it means to be gentle and generous? And Christ called for such gentleness and for such generosity, which are tantamount to hypocritical righteousness and complicity with the evildoers? The teaching of the apostles and fathers of the church, of course, advanced a completely different understanding. God's servants need a sword and do not wear it in vain. Romans 13.4 They are a threat to the villains. And it was in the spirit of this understanding that St. Fyodosi Pechorsky said, Live in peace not only with your friends, but also with your enemies, but only your personal enemies, and not the enemies of God. Thus, the beginning of the spirit limits the scope of love in its immediate, naive overflow.